Welcome to A Cult of Personality, esoteric podcast extraordinaire. I'm your host, Greg Kaminsky. This is episode number 202, featuring an outstanding interview with Michael Martin about the revised version of The Chemical Wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz and much more. A Cult of Personality podcast is made possible by you, the listeners, and by the subscribers to ChamberOfReflection.com, our membership site. This episode is also sponsored by several listeners who made generous donations to aid us and the cause of informed, authentic, and accessible interviews about Western esotericism. Thank you again, Martin, Andrew, David, and Judith. Because of your donations and the support of the subscribers to the Chamber of Reflection, we're able to bring you interviews of this caliber and more to come. Now, in episode number 202, Michael Martin joins us to discuss this recent version of The Chemical Wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz, which features two of his essays that recontextualize and add a much greater depth of meaning to the story. To put it briefly, my interpretation of Martin's assertion is that the actual intention of the text was to allow readers to see through the attachments to pride, recognition, knowledge, whether esoteric or mundane, and instead gather themselves around a simpler spirituality that endeavors to see and understand the vast mystery of reality beyond any classification or even languaging. But, it's clear that it wasn't exactly a promotion of what seems to have occurred in terms of secret societies and esoteric orders and fraternities and what have you. I think Martin's work here is crucial and I'm really thrilled to be able to talk to him about it and share that conversation with you. Although I wish I'd encountered Martin years ago when I first became interested in Rosicrucianism, but it seems fitting that it has taken until now. I would dare to say that his analysis is worth your time and consideration. It might even bring about new insights or different ways of appreciating Western magic and esotericism. And related to Rosicrucianism, Michael also talks about sophiology, a radical way of seeing and feeling the world as the deepest mystery of reality, a form of Western non-duality, if you will. Our conversation here only touches the tip of the iceberg of scholarship and mysticism that lay beneath. Michael Martin, Ph.D., is a philosopher, poet, musician, songwriter, editor, and biodynamic farmer. He spent 16 years as a Waldorf teacher and master teacher and taught at the university and college level for over 17 years. He began biodynamic farming in 1990 and currently raises dairy goats, bees, and other animals while managing a market garden with his wife and some of his nine children. His poetry and scholarship have appeared in many journals, and he is the editor of Jesus the Imagination, a journal of spiritual revolution. The intro music is Awakening by Paul Avgerinos, and the outro music is Wild Rose by Barry Sulkin. Michael Martin, thank you for agreeing to sit down with me today. I appreciate it very much. I appreciate the offer. Thanks. Um, I was first introduced to your work through this book that recently came out, The Chemical Wedding of Christian Rosenkreuz. Of course, this is not the first uh, time this has been published, obviously, <laughs> but um, this is a edition of the Ezekiel Foxcroft translation, but it's revised and you put some essays surrounding it um, that I think at least for many readers would recontextualize this particular yeah. text. Um, mm -hmm. 
and in my opinion, make it more valuable than it ever could have been before that without this sort of understanding that you impart to the reader. Mm -hmm. Um, but before we talk more about the book, maybe you could just briefly introduce yourself okay. to the listeners. Well, I, I'm, I do a lot of different things. Uh, a, first of all, I'm a biodynamic farmer, but I have a PhD in, in English. And uh, my specialty in English literature is uh, 16th and 17th century uh, religious literature. And The Chemical Wedding comes right in there because the Foxcroft's uh, edition was published in 1690. Mm. So, you know, that's kind of what I've been thinking about. In fact, I've been thinking about it for, for my most all my adult life, I would think. I think I first bought the, a copy of uh, The Real History of the Rosicrucians by A.E. Waite. It was probably 20. Mm -hmm. You know, didn't understand much of it. And, you know, like when you read Alchemy, it's <laughs> no one understands it. You know, but... You know, I was intrigued, and I, and I was intrigued at first by the artwork that accompanied yes. it, a chemical text, you know, because yeah. it, it started with me taking uh, a printmaking class. I wasn't even enrolled in college yet. Someone said, hey, I want to take this class. So I took this class, and I was really intrigued by, by these engravings. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, gradually, step by step, I started to get involved, read The Chemical Wedding and The Fama and The Confessio, and... I had to spend about 25 or 30 years thinking about it, you know, because, you know, and plus you read commentaries, which make it even more confusing. Yes. You know, there are so many different commentaries out there, whether from coming from an anthroposophical standpoint or a hermetic standpoint or whatever, psychological standpoint. And it was just confusing, but I loved the book yeah. and I was intrigued by the story. Mm -hmm. And, I was also intrigued by, even if you read any anything really, any, any critical literature, they always talk about how Johann Valentin von Andre uh, would ask about his involvement with writing this story. He said, "Well, you know, basically, he said it was a joke, it was a game, you know, mm -hmm. and no one, t no one believes him." <laughs> and all the esoteric commentators say, "What could he mean by that?" It can't be a joke. He must mean something. No, he actually means it's a joke, which is what when I finally got around to writing about it, and I wouldn't have done it, but a friend of mine from graduate school said, you're probably the only person I know who could actually write something interesting or original about the chemical wedding. You ought to give it a, give it a crack. Mm. So I did. And it was fun, actually, to get into it finally. Because, you know, after, you know, I think I'm a kind of a slow thinker, I don't jump to conclusions, mm -hmm. you know, I, I need a long time to kind of contemplate what it is. And, you know, this one took 25 or 30 years, but that's what, that's what, what drew me to it. And I thought, well, what if he is playing games? How can we read and how can I read this with that? Yeah. Which is what I, my approach was when I, when I took it up again. Yeah. It's really, uh, insightful, I would say, because I think that is a, sort of a primary aspect of this, these texts, especially this one. Um, can you talk more about exactly sort of your interpretation of what he meant by a game, a, this serious mm -hmm. game? Yeah. And, and the, there's, this. I mean, the implications yeah. of this are tremendous, uh, especially for people who I think who are listening to this. Well, what I what I what I concluded he was doing, and, and it was inspired in part by uh, Stanley Fish, who uh, uh, talks about his book called "Self Consuming Artifacts," which which was uh, he wrote, and he was an expert on still is on seventeenth century literature, and he talks about how the literature, the religious literature at the time, was not just to kind of not just apologetics or ex ex explicate, uh, explicating dogma, but it was really uh, physic for the soul. So he points to John Donne's, uh, uh, what's, what's it called? Uh, Death Stool. Yeah. You know, the, his last um, sermon when he was practically dead himself. And he also points to uh, Francis Bacon 
and in the essays and also yeah. to um, George Herbert, mm -hmm. which the idea with those texts, according to Fish, and, and I agree with them, is that they're, they're devised in such a way that if you rely on them, you don't get what you're supposed to get out of it. They're supposed to, they're, uh, he, he compares it to being on a ladder and having somebody kick out the rungs on, underneath you as you're climbing up again, no place else to go. Mm -hmm. And, and that's what I think that the chemical wedding is. And I, and I think what Andre is doing there is, is, is giving us what we think we want, you know, and he makes so much fun of an, esoteric pride or academic pride. I mean, it's one of his primary uh, targets in, in the book, but he's, he's pointing out that if you rely on me for these things, you are doing the wrong thing. You're, there's no, the secret is you have the secret, right? Mm -hmm. So that, so it's really a conditioning of the soul, which I think is, it's really useful in that way because, but I think, unfortunately, I think we have uh, 400 and some years of, people not getting it. Yeah. You know, and one of the things I, I use as a reference point in the introductory essay is uh, Foucault's pendulum, mm -hmm. which is a, it's another one. It's a, it's a 500 page setup of a joke, right? Yes. And uh brilliant setup. It is a brilliant setup. And I think, and I think uh, you can tell from echo, he's a sharp reader of this literature. Very sharp. You know, and he knows what they're doing. Yes. And he knows when he knows what the chemical wedding is doing, I think. I think you're right. Yeah. And I think that's the interesting thing about it. And then, but that's what happens in, in uh, Bembo, the, the character in the, in the book, when he, when he finally outs himself. It outs all these people who think they they belong to this esoteric order that didn't exist till he invented it, but it goes back hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. You know, pull out the cork, he says. Right? Um, and they get incensed. That he would do this. That's right. And, I, and that actually, that's kind of the uh, response I was waiting for. And I'm sure I've, <laughs> I've had in some, some quarters about this because, you know, I, my, part of my expertise in the literature is on esoteric texts, so-called esoteric texts. I don't, I think they're like Thomas Vaughn, for instance. I have a, I have a chapter in my first book on Thomas and Henry Vaughn. And I've written about John Dee, and I've written about Ken Sir Kenelm Digby, if you know about him. And also, I have another chapter in another book on Robert Flood. Oh, yeah. And, but I don't, you know, unlike most of my peers in academia, when they read those texts, they try to dismiss those guys as kooks. Yes. But they weren't kooks. And in fact, anything, you could call them, they were, they were actually trying to preserve uh, a picture of metaphysics and of the world that was vanishing because of the scientific revolution. Yeah, that's true. You know, and we could almost call them traditionalists in a way. Yeah, I would agree with that. They, they were rejecting pure nature, you know, that there's such a thing. There's a, a Descartian bifurcation of reality. You know, they're rejecting that out, yes. outright. In fact, uh, Thomas Vaughn calls, <laughs> calls them the whimsies of Descartes. You know, mm -hmm. he despises them because he doesn't get what reality is. That is reality as a physical and spiritual reality at one time. Yeah, it's not, really Aristotelian in a way. Yeah, like what am I when I'm not thinking? Mm -hmm. yeah. So would it be accurate, do you think, to characterize what you're describing here as a Turning away from the sort of the esoteric orders, the the mythopoetic origin stories, and more towards a per, almost like personal mysticism of like the 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 real mystery is is found within, and it's not going to be revealed to you by some hierophant that that comes along. Uh, um, well, well, like a self-initiation kind of thing? Not necessarily self-initiation, uh -huh. but I'm thinking more of like a, like Jakob Berme comes to mind. That's yeah. sort of like a innocent 
mysticism of yeah. the heart. That's what I, and I think, I, I don't think there's that much evidence. Well, Andre would not, he was a contemporary, exact contemporary of Burma. And, uh, I don't think there's any evidence that he read him, but there was something percolating in Germany at the time that, you know, this, you know, it's almost an oxymoron now, but Protestant mysticism, right? That I think with Burma, it, he kind of set, reset, uh, mysticism in a, in a way that in the 20th century, Martin Heidegger did with philosophy, mm-hmm. just kind of start game over. We're starting over from scratch. And I think, and I think that that's, also present in the, in the Rosicrucianism of the 17th century. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that's, that's there. But I, I th- also think there's, um, in the Fama and the Confessio, and less in the Chemical Wedding, but there's uh, this, I think it's a true and sincere desire for the regeneration of culture. Of, of society, mm-hmm. you know, it's what we call it the, the general reformation, right? They yes. wanted the ge- reformation of everything. Yeah. Of because the culture the, of theology of, of science, science, of everything. Yeah. And people point to Francis Bacon as being part of it. I don't think that's true at all. Mm-hmm. I don't think Bacon, there's, there's, as far as I can see, there's nothing Rosicrucian in him. Um, and the Rosa, the Rosicrucian ethos. And you do see this in Rudolf Steiner. Is, is out there as Steiner can be in certain, certain regards when he comes to what reality is, you know, the, the relationship of I'm looking up my, at my garden and my compost pile and the relationship of compost to the cosmos, yeah. you know, there it is right there. And that's Rosicrucianism as far as I'm concerned. Would you think it's wrong to see it as uh I don't know if these labels suffice, but sort of like a Western non-duality, sort of non-dualism. Absolutely. Okay. It's Aristotelian in that way. You know, there's not, uh, I think, and, and I also I've wrote, written a couple of books on sophiology. Mm-hmm. And sophiology is exactly that, saying that there is no, and this is what uh, natura pura or pure nature philosophy was, was saying that, you know, could there be any person, thing, place in, in, in the creation that's God's presence is absent from. And that's really, that's Descartes, right? And the Rosicrucians and sophiologists, the Burma one, they absolutely reject that idea. Mm-hmm. Right. And it, so it's Aristotelian in that way. In fact, um, um, if you've ever seen them, I don't know if you can, you can probably get, get the, you can certainly get them on the internet, but, uh, in Robert Flood's books, you know, how beautifully illustrated they are. He has a, a theme he goes back to again and again of, uh, the double pyramid, mm-hmm. which is the two triangles that intersect each other. Um, and at, at the one end of the, like the apex of one triangle, so it's say the, the base is at the bottom. So that's, the bottom is pure, pure matter. Mm-hmm. Apex is, is pure spirit, but they're never absent from one another. So, sometimes they have more, more matter and more spirit, mm-hmm. but they're never uh, alienated from each other. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's what the Rosicrucians, sophiologists, that's what they were trying to n- not lose because that really was the default position in Christianity, but in every spiritual tradition, I would say maybe, maybe not with Hinduism so much. You know, there there was definitely duality in, in some of the more systems, but <laughs> and paganism, right? Neo paganism, it's all about that, mm-hmm. right? So I think uh, that's a good thing, and I think it's a good thing to be reminded of because I think a lot of the things we see. And I was just writing about this this morning. Um, a lot of things we see in, in the world that are just so disordered are disordered because of this uh this break between the sp- spirit and matter or reality and non-reality mm-hmm. right so I, and so that, that's that's kind of been those things have preoccupied me for a long time but especially for the last five or six years um i don't know if this is a digression but i feel like it's maybe not um if if people accept what you're saying, and I, I certainly agree with you, um, 
why is it that so few of the so-called esoteric schools that embrace this entire view of reality, maybe not as well articulated as you just did, but mm -hmm. were as well considered even. But if that's the view, why wouldn't the aim be to pursue the realization of that? Mm -hmm. Or, well, I mean, maybe in some places uh, it is, but... Well, I think it depends on where you go. I think certainly St in Steiner's work, for instance, he does pursue that. And he actually he comes up with, came up with all these practical things mm -hmm. that acknowledge that, whether it's biodynamic farming or Waldorf schools or anthroposophical medicine, whatever. So he takes it into consideration. I think the problem there is that anthroposophists can be a little off-putting or seem cultish to people from outside of the group. So they come closer like, whoa, this is kind of weird for me, mm -hmm. you know? Um, esoteric groups, though, I, it's hard to say. It's hard to say. Um, I think probably the regret of, of you and Valentin when uh, people started to make a big deal about Rosicrucianism in the middle part of the 17th century. It's like, you didn't get it. And all of a sudden, <laughs> these people were starting all these groups. We're Rosicrucians. We must be. I've just discovered that I'm Rosicrucian. And, and I'm not saying those people aren't Rosicrucians, but I don't, I just because you, you know, you, you have Rosicrucian swag doesn't make you a Rosicrucian. And I think, um, Amork or all those kinds of things, which I think there is a little bit of Rosicrucian in all of them, mm -hmm. but, but I think when they go, um, like Blavatsky in uh, Isis Unveiled, mm -hmm. it's kind of a Rosicrucian book, you know? Yeah. It's kind of a Western mystery yeah, tradition yeah, book, definitely. unlike The Secret Doctrine, which right. more goes Buddhist and <laughs> Hinduism. Um, but I, I think, in the, at least in those uh, iterations, what they do is they, they discard the, the Christian impulse, mm -hmm. Which is so central to at least this. When I think of Rosicrucianism, I think of the 17th century, okay. those three books. Yeah. You know, and what's articulated there, that's like, that's the starting point. Okay. And probably the, the good part is it gave people more license to explore their own avenues about it. Mm -hmm. the bad part is it gave people more license to explore their own avenues about it. So it could end up being about anything, you know. And I think this happened in Steiner's early work. You know, where he was really stuck to the Theosophical Society for a while mm -hmm. and talking about masters and yes. uh, Perlai and Manvantara, which all disappears by the time he actually does the really interesting stuff with mm -hmm. farming and education. Right. You know? So, I mean, it's, it's hard to say, but I, I, I definitely think, and this is what turned me off to esoteric groups back in the day, it... I don't know. Well, in the Catholic Church, for instance, as screwed up as it can be, you have a hierarchy, you know where you stand, you know, you, you have checks and balances. Right. Just like academia, as screwed up as that can be, at least you have checks and balances. You come mm -hmm. up with crazy ideas, you go, what do you think of my crazy idea? No. And, but you don't get that in esoteric schools. So you, people get freedom to just say whatever they want to say, and it might be true, it might not be true, but it it leads very often leads people into megalomania and just craziness, mm -hmm. you know, and, and give it gives everybody else a bad name. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. Good point. Could you say more about, um, sophiology? Like how would you define that? Uh, how does one study it? What are some of the texts and yeah, sure. people involved? Uh, so sophiology, I, um, I heard the word, you know, when I was a kid, wasn't sure what it meant. I heard talk, people talk about Sophia. But um, well, that's a while ago. I started reading Russian philosophy mm -hmm. and, and uh, reading Nicholas Berjayev and uh, Vladimir Soloviev. Mm -hmm. and, and the Sophiology comes in there, especially with the Soloviev. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I started reading more and more about it. It was really intriguing to me. Um, um, I'm kind of acquainted with Robert Powell. I don't know if you know who that is. Mm -hmm. Robert Powell and 
one, I, gosh, this is when I was working on my master's degree in about 2000. I was going to do it on Valentin Tomberg. Oh, yeah. Uh, my master's thesis. But I couldn't, uh, I couldn't get anybody to get on board <laughs> at the oh. university. But I, I in, in the process of it, I called Robert Powell. For, I don't know how I got his phone number. And he was in Germany at the time. And, and he was very helpful. But so, uh, and so all these things were, I was, I was investigating Tomberg and uh, his book, Meditations on the Tarot yeah. also touches on sociology quite a bit. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, so it was always there, but I wasn't really too invested in it. And then when I was working on my PhD, working on my dissertation, I was, like I said, I was doing it on, uh, part of his on Thomas and Henry Vaughn. Right. And another chapter was on Jane Led. Mm -hmm. the Philadelphian yeah. society. And I remember reading through them like, and I saw how much sociology was in there in both of all, yeah. all three of them. And also how much Burma was there. Yes. I mean, and I think, I think sociology would not have taken off without him. He's ground zero. And even though, um, you can go back to, to the Proverbs or the book of, of Sirach or wisdom. And then you, it's, those are like the foundational texts of sophiology, but somehow it took this cobbler from, from Bavaria to rediscover it, you know? And so that, so, so I, I think, uh, Burma's book, the way to Christ mm -hmm. is a foundational text in that. Cause most of his stuff is really hard to read yeah. and that's not an easy book to read, but it's the easiest of his books to read. Um, Jane led as well. She was a follower of Burma. She was in England, uh, with the Philadelphian society, which is a fascinating yeah. point, point of history. And her books, I think you can get most of them for free online, which is, you know, I was thankful when I was working on my dissertation that, cause, um, just 10 years before that, I was trying to do something on Robert Flood, but couldn't get a book. None of them are in print. They're all in Latin. And the only book within, 500 miles, I think the closest one after this was in Harvard, was at U of M's Rare Book Library. So I had to go there, and it was like visiting somebody in prison. I know, I know. I've been in that Harvard <laughs> Rare Book. You have to check things out. And, and they, Well, you couldn't check it out. You had to read it there. I mean, yeah, you have to get yeah. it, check it out there. They No phone or That's camera. Right. And or, the guards right there. Yeah, you have to, like, no pens <laughs> or pencils. So, like, well, how am I Can't supposed touch. to? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, so I was really thankful just a few years later when Google digitized most of those texts. Yeah, that's good. Which is whew, saved my life. Um, but so, so you see it also in Robert Flood, you know, and his mosaical philosophy. It's all over the place in there. All of, all the all the way through his books, he's going back to this again and again. And um, so, who well, else? Soloviev, and then there were more mainstream Russian philosopher, theologians and philosophers like Sergei Bulgakov uh -huh. and pa Pavel Florensky, who wrote, uh, in fact, I think Florensky's book, uh, The Pillar and Ground of the Truth, is actually the model for uh, Tom Berg's Meditations on the Tarot. Because hmm. each one, I was surprised to find it, each one starts with a, um, an emblem just like tarot starts with, with a card and they're all written in letters as letters. And there's one uh, very interesting letter on Sophia. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's those are some in, uh, foundational texts okay. in sophiology. So, but with sophiology, the idea is like, we're talk, it's really kind of a Rosicrucianism that the world is integral, right? It's how do you discern um, the glory of the Lord? Right. That's what, the Shekinah. It's really, and Kabbalah too, I think with the Shekinah, it's, mm -hmm. it's sophiology as far as I'm concerned. Um, because, and, and I think you actually, another foundational text for sophiology, believe it or not, is, uh, Terrence Malick's films. Huh. And in particular, uh, the tree of life. Have you seen it? If you haven't seen it, you need to see it. it. But, and, and also, uh, the thin red line is another one because, in all of his films, you, you, there's this, I shouldn't say all, but most of his films, there's a presentation where you see human life with all of its tragedies and troubles, right? 
but there's still something shining through, right? In fact, that's the last line of his film, uh, the, the Thin Red Line, all things shining, right? And so and that's what sociology is. It's attentiveness to that shining. And I kind of stumbled on this in a, I, stu- I shouldn't say I stumbled onto it. I, I understood sociology. I had been reading about for 20 years through uh, a kind of in-depth study of phenomenology. Say more about that. Phenomenology is, well, it doesn't start with Husserl, but Husserl is probably the most popular uh, innovator of it. But it came from Franz Brentano, who was Husserl's teacher and Steiner's teacher. And Steiner certainly works out of sociology and and all of them draw on Goethe's phenomenology right yeah which just and this is where I got into it as a literary critic right is I didn't I didn't have much patience with what uh, Harold Bloom calls the schools of resentment you know with dif- different kinds of literary criticism which aren't which are really political agendas projected onto a work of literature I always turned me off so I was kept thinking well let's let's say What's a way to do this that uh, respects the integrity of the work and the author and doesn't dismiss them to, a, you know, a trope of racist or whatever it happens to be, right? right? Um, and I wrote a book on this called The Incarnation of the Poet, Poetic Word. Um, so with phenomenology, though, so and in fact, it was actually not Husserl. It was Heidegger studying being in time. I started to get the sense of when you can perform what, what epo, uh, the epoche, which is uh, a bracketing, where you have your assumptions. And this is what Husserl says, what Heidegger says. You push all your preconceptions as much as you can to the side while you're encountering phenomena. This is what uh, Goethe did, right? So, And if you can do that, and it takes time. It doesn't happen like in five minutes. It, it happens like my, my experience with a chemical wedding over the course of time. But you hold it in reverence and eventually it will sh- reveal itself to you. Right. And I also think that, um, and this happens, you know, part of my um, being is invested in poetry. And, you know, we've all had these experiences with, with the arts in particular, but also with nature, where you're attentive to something and you're not what expect, you don't have expectations of it, but you're attentive to it and it reveals itself to you, whether it's a poem or nature, you know, and it, and that's, that's what the shining is, right? That's the, that's the splendor. What's that word? Uh, Hans Ver, uh, Urs von Balthasar uses a splendor or the shining, you know, it's, it's actually, if you think about it in terms of the Genesis story, it's the light of the first day. Mm-hmm. Right, and this is something Robert Flood was uh, always talking about in his books. Is you know, these meditations on the, the difference between light and light, you know, like between life and life, right? Between Zoe or Bios. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When, when, when Jesus says, "I am, I am," <laughs> you know, "I'm the way, the truth, and the life," right? He doesn't mean I'm biology. Right. He's like. There's something that makes livingness alive. Right. And, and, and that's, that's what sociology reveals. That's fascinating. Um, I guess this would be a good point since you mentioned this sort of way in which you pay attention and then that attention results in some sort of Maybe revelation or unfoldment, opening. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so this is probably a good point to talk about love because, in many ways, <clears throat> love and attention are kind of, in my mind, synonymous because we, what we love, we pay attention to. Absolutely. So can we? Can you talk more about love and eros and how that sort of fits in with all of this? Oh, eros is all over the place in this. Um, so, Simone Weil, for instance, you know, just one of her one quote I just love is, uh, "Attention is the rarest and purest form of generosity." 
right? So, so if you're attending to something, you can't, I mean, there is an erotic relationship to it, right? Mm-hmm. There, and you, 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 you have this erotic relationship because it's separate from you, right? You can never be filled. Metaphysical desire, right? right? It can so never be filled, longing, but, yeah. but the longing, but the more you're filled, the more you have, the more you get fed, the more you desire, yes. right? And, and that's, um, I think in, uh, in Proverbs, for instance, with, uh, when, when Sophia speaks or Hokma speaks in Proverbs eight, you know, she talks and my, she says, uh, there I was, I was his plaything mm-hmm. talking about God's plaything. And I, and I found delight in the children of men. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's it. It goes both ways too. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's, it kind of, uh, even though I, it's easy to dismiss Aquinas as not doing that, but Aquinas is actually attentive to that. Mm-hmm. Um, but too often in scholastic theology, the love is an, is an, it's an abstract kind of philosophical term and it's not an erotic relationship. But I think sophiology, Rosicrucianism, as I understand it, you know, you, you, you form this. And I think not only is it a, a loving relationship with that, which is what's outside of you. And, uh, we could say, uh, it's like uh, uh, the microcosm macrocosm is a nice way to think about it. Another way to think about it is, uh, David Bohm's idea of implicate order, mm-hmm. right? Where, what is the whole is implicit in, in the, in the individual and the individual is implicit in the whole. So that's an erotic relationship, right? And that I think is not only is it, is it an erotic relationship, but it's a healing relationship. Mm -hmm. And I think so much we, what we see in our culture is lacking that. Yeah. Absolutely lacking it, you know? And, 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 and my, uh, (laughs) <laughs> mission in a way, or, or the thing that preoccupies me is how can we get that to enter back into human life? You know, in my book on uh, the incarnation of the poetic word, there's a chap- chapter on Robert Herrick, mm-hmm. the English poet. But I love Robert Herrick because he embraces the world as it is. And it's a, his book, uh, Hesperides, is so messy. It's no, There's no order, no rhyme or reason to how he throws things together, but there's 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 uh kind of a palimpsest of uh Catholicism shows up, pagan Rome shows up, then kind of a na- uh, neo or a pagan folk religion is all over the place there as well, and he embraces it all, right? And and I think that's how that's we should be like that, you know. I think too often what we see is people, and I don't care where it is, whether it's in religion, philosophy, politics esoteric groups, they form camps, right? Oh, yeah. And Robert Herrick doesn't is that again, wait. The only camp he's against is he's against, the par- he's, he's against the party poopers who are trying to take all the fun away from everybody. Right. Right. Take t- take that messiness away and try to order everything, right? Yeah. That's what everybody wants. They want to just, we need to get everybody on the same page. Well, that's what the mind does, right? That's that's what we do with knowledge. Mm-hmm. We classify Compart- it. And pure Aristotle, it and, right? Yeah, and and... In many ways, wisdom, or what you're talking about, is the opposite of that. It is embracing it all, all as it, yeah. in its totality, yeah. and not having concepts and ideas and thoughts that weigh it down right. and make it all so heavy and. Oh, yeah. yeah. What well, is it's it's you know and you find and this is why I think poets, uh, the un- un- unacknowledged legislators of the world, right. John Keats with his idea of negative capability. I don't need to have everything figured out. I can live in this tension with with things not uh, abstracted into submission. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah, in many ways, living in the in the in the mystery it is to really be alive. But mm-hmm. It is to to know it all is. It's- to, to really be like a robot in yeah. many ways. And I, that's what always turned me off about some esoteric you know, peeps, you know, who it becomes a kind of uh, antiquarianism. Oh, you know for I mean? sure. And I mean, it was for me for a long time. Well, me too. It's a collecting data. Yeah. But then, it, you know, I think, well, what, how does this contribute to the way I actually live? 
you know, then and it's easy maybe before you have children. <laughs> yeah, it's, it is easier yeah. before yeah. you have children. But then you have children, and you go, "Wow, this is just. I need. There's. We need to have more here." Yeah, yeah. yeah. And there's nothing wrong with being an antiquarian. No. But if you think that's the be all and end all of human existence, and that everybody else should be an antiquarian. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I found for me personally what there it was all wrapped up in this desire to know and understand for my own sake, and also. <laughs> to know more than other people because that would make me feel better about myself. So yeah, that's not really a healthy way to be. No. But it but I also think it comes from a dissatisfaction with what, with our education, oh, with the way we've been taught, you know, there's absolutely. something's missing completely. You know? Yeah. Well, that's, a, and that's the erotic comes back. In, it, right? Well, that's right. Cause I think it's like a really uh, like very, base like intuition of like the emptiness of all things and and that's yep. really like that's the doorway to what you're talking discovering what you're talking about uh-huh. yeah and that and i think it's 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 something well this is thomas Traherne, right thomas Traherne's poetry is all about this or returning to the garden mm-hmm. right about returning to that vision of oneness with the whole yeah. Right. Yeah. I think he's. I think he's too often dismissed as a kind of a Pollyanna, but I don't think he's that at all. I think he's probably one of the wisest philosophers ever to come out of England, because, you know, it's all about perception. How you see the world is how it is. Yes. And if you can change the way you perceive it, you can change the world. You know, it's implicate order. Yeah. I mean, the. I think the main problem is most people's vision lacks the clarity and the strength to be able to hold that for more than a very finite moment in time. And it's even harder now in a, in a hyper distracted society, right? Yeah. But I, I, I think it requires, like you said, like patience, contemplation, Uh being quiet, um, you know, and there's many methods to like achieve those sorts of states, but but I think the thing is you have to pursue it. It has to be an act of will, right? Yeah, and it doesn't come naturally. It doesn't. No, it seems like that's in opposite. our society it doesn't because you know. Yeah, that's why I left my phone down. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to be distracted. I mean, I, mean I can say I, as a human being, my tendency is like laziness, like I. Like the least, expending the least amount of effort that I have to, to be comfortable. It's conservation of energy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, well, that is. But, but the other thing I think, though, is one, and this is what we've been trying to do here at my farm, is, you know, it's, it's, especially during the growing season, we're, we work 14-hour days. Yeah, but you have to. on the other hand, you know, we're engaged with the real. Right. Those are real things where, you know. How to make things grow is a real thing. Oh, for sure. you know, and have hard for a, work for a guy who grew up in the city like I did in Detroit, right? It's uh, it, it's what's well, healing for one thing, but the other thing is it, it's you can see it's a return to what to the real, and and it's a luxury f- for me that we that I'm out, outside all, so much, but I I would have to say that that's probably just an extension of. And I think I get into the same kind of space when I'm in the garden that I'm, my wife, uh, my, when I, when I, was, I used to be a Waldorf teacher, and um, one of my friends said something to me, because I play the guitar, and I had a guitar at school, and I was playing in my, in my office when the kids were out, or in my, my room when the kids are outside of recess. And I was just playing, and my friend came in, and she said, Michael, you don't look the same. Because I was in kind of improvising, I was not trying to learn something. It was I was in a in the zone, right? Mm-hmm. And that happens. In music happens in the garden. It happens in my relationship with poetry or scripture or whatever it happens to be, right? That that's that's something that people can make a reality. But the thing is, it has to be nurtured. Yeah, you know, you have to you have to cultivate it. Yeah, I remember reading. I am that. I don't know if you're familiar with this, Nisargadatta. Uh-huh. And one of the things he said is like, anything can become a way provided you're interested enough in it. Mm-hmm. You pay enough attention to it. If you do it enough, 
anything can become a way to, to that yep. that you're talking about. You know, you know, it can all can become a prayer. Yeah. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Everything is sacred yeah. in that way. Yeah. Um, could you talk a little bit more about your relationship with Steiner and his material and um, how that has evolved over time? Yeah. Um, so I probably first encountered, I was actually, when I first encountered Steiner, I went into a, an occult bookstore looking for a book on Rosicrucians. Mm -hmm. And the guy, actually, I ended up working there later, and then I met my wife there. Um, the guy sold me a book called, and I don't know, I don't know where it is. I was looking for it the other day. Uh, Rosicrucian Esotericism, it's called. I used to have that book. But if, you're, if that's going to be your introduction to Rosicrucianism, it's a bad place to start. Yeah. <laughs> because uh, standard is not easy to read. No. You know? Um but I, and I, what I happened though is I, and I ended up working at this store, and I was reading a little bit of Steiner, trying to anyway. It's in my early twenties, but I started to meet all these people who were Waldorf teachers because they would come in there to get their Steiner books, and they said, "You know what? You'd be a really good Waldorf teacher." I said, "Really?" So I started to talk to them, and they said, "Why don't you come down to the school? You know, you can visit." And they offered me a job as an assistant. Mm -hmm. I hadn't finished my bachelor's degree yet, so. I got to see it, and what was wonderful about it is I did a practicum in every grade. Oh, okay. So I was a really good Waldorf teacher. You know, I had I knew the whole yeah. scope. And, in fact, they were really lovely people. They, they, all, they said, you know what? We don't have a teacher training here, but we're going to take it on. We're going to train you, which I actually I think they had the best training a Waldorf teacher could have because of that. Um, so, so that's – I kind of got it – by an enculturation. And, uh, like you said, you know, at first I would read it and I was just gathering information and esoteric constructs, you know, like Steiner's book, cult science, for instance. Mm -hmm. Um, but then, uh, I, one of the people I also met who actually got me the interview for the job, he was, he was the doing the maintenance and the, the grounds at the school, but he had, uh, there was at one point uh, at the Detroit Waldorf School where I taught. Uh, uh, there was a teacher training center in Southfield, Michigan, in a place at Dunscotus Friary. Okay. Which is now something else. They sold the Franciscan sold it, but it was beautiful Romanesque church. I mean, really beautiful, huge grounds, probably on a hundred acres in the middle of Southfield, nice. and they had this beautiful garden. Where I used to in, a, in an apple orchard. I used to go there because I worked across the street for a while and I would have lunch there. Mm -hmm. Had no idea there was a Waldorf, or there, even that there was a Waldorf education. But I thought, well, it turns out later that my friend was running this garden with Alan York. I don't know if you know who Alan no. York was. Alan York is the guy who basically single handedly saved the wine industry. And this is about um, 25, 26 years ago. Um, what happened, we, Alan had left Detroit and he was, uh, I think he was living in California. And so we called him up on the phone. We were, cause we were thinking about getting some land to start a farm. And he said, I did, he just sold his farm. I said, what? And because he was doing so much consulting work for vineyards, because 25, 30 years ago, the wine industry was freaking out because they thought within 20 years there would be no grapes any place because they were being overrun with disease and pests and all this stuff. And so Alan went to this consulting stuff and you can see videos of him all over the place on, on YouTube, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, where he took these wineries and brought in biogenetic principles and brought them back to life. Okay. In fact, he even did one for Sting. Oh. You know, from the police. Uh -huh. uh, and he died a couple years ago, maybe five years ago now, unfortunately. He was only 64, I think. But he's also in this film, uh, The Biggest Little Farm, I think it's called. Came on documentary about a year ago. Hmm. And he's in there. In fact, he dies in the middle of the film. That's where my wife and I went to see it. I said, oh my gosh, there's, there's Alan. So, so, my, so part of my entr entrance into Steiner was reading the super esoteric stuff like occult science, it's stuff that, like, you know, in a, or karmic relationships. And the other part was the really practical stuff with farming and education, right. you know? And so, so that, so over time though, looking back at it now, 
So I left being a Waldorf teacher in 2007. Um, and I've, and we always ran our gardens biodynamically and just get, it kept getting bigger into a farm. Um, but what I've noticed is that, um, not everybody, but a lot of anthroposophists and a lot of people just, you know, when they think, they look at a thinker, say they're looking at Tom or Steiner or her chief, they want to think that the person was born with all the same ideas that he died with, right? Yeah. That he didn't develop over time. And it's clear to me, Steiner changed and developed not only when he started his esoteric career, but his whole career. Because before he, he started an esoteric career, he was kind of a bohemian intellectual, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Editing uh, Goethe's scientific papers. But then, you know, he, he had some, definitely, you can see, you can tell he had some natural clairvoyance. Uh, but which he developed as a thinking, not uh, just purely through a kind of a mode of intuition. He developed it through thinking, you know. And I think he got this through German idealism, too, and Goethe in particular. Yeah. And uh, But he changed over time because when he first started giving public lectures when he was on the theosophical side, there's all this stuff about Pralaya and Manvantara and the masters, and, which is, you know, you get from Blavatsky. But... That stuff disappears by the time, you know, he, after World War I, for, for sure. Yeah. You know, so he changed quite a bit. And people don't want to think that he changed, which is kind of strange. But And so my relationship to him changed as well over that time. And I, I would say for a few years, uh, I was kind of on a St Steiner sabbatical. <laughs> I was giving him a rest. Mm -hmm. But then I realized, this is only about four years ago, I said, wow, you know what? I did not realize how important the way that man thinks has impacted me, you know, in good ways, in good ways. And so, so that, you know, and even recently I was trying to read uh, some lectures he gave in 1905 though, or 1904, really early on masonry, yeah. the temple legend. Yeah. Um, but it's so different than this, you know, usually, um, usually when I read standard these days, it's to go back to the, farming stuff around beekeeping you know which is it's a different person yeah totally different person in those, those lectures yeah. and and i think he's he's both more seasoned or and more grounded yeah. um, i don't know why that is but i imagine he just I mean, uh, his his prayer life just and i think his meditative life is deepened yeah I, I, those years that's my impression like just that deepens and matures as some, as one gets older and experiences yeah. life and the ups and downs of existence. Yeah. And I think, I think actually people don't talk about, it, but I think world war one profoundly wow. changed him. How could it not? Yeah. I mean, it just was such a huge upheaval to society. Yeah. And he really saw it's over. You know, unless somebody does something, and and that and that's what I, I think I most admire about him, because philosophers, esotericists, they all talk a good game. Not many people actually do something. Yeah, that was always my impression of Steiner. Is like he he never hesitated to like engage with the world, yeah. like giving free lectures, like trying to actually help people on the level that they needed help. Yeah. So I think that was impressive to me that he, he wasn't trying to foist his philosophy on anybody. Right. He was like, he was really like meeting people where they were yeah. and just doing whatever he could. And he always said, don't take my word for it. <laughs> See if it works for you. Right. You know? Yeah. That's in many ways, kind of a rare thing for uh, a modern Western occult, Mm -hmm. thinker teacher yeah so i have a lot of respect for him in, in respect to that yeah me too um i'm curious about um some of the other books you've written i know you sort of mentioned them as we've been talking but i don't know if you want to like uh, well, talk okay. about them a little more in detail well I, there's a uh, literature in the encounter with god and uh what's it called in post-reformation england um so that's got a chapter on john d and his discussions with, with spirits 
and also um, John John Dunn, mm-hmm. and then um, Callum Digby, J- Henry, and Thomas Vaughn, and then Jane Led. So that so that that's a scholarly monograph. That's it's probably the de- most dense book I've read. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but you know, when that book came out, I got I had no trouble getting it published. But the publisher and the academic publishers do this; they were charging one hundred and ten bucks for the sure. book, yeah. and I'm like. That is no fair to anybody, you know. That's and they don't. There's no way they have to have to do that. And if they, I think it's a horrible business model anyway. Well, yeah. I I mean, I'm certainly not trying to justify it, but I I know that the amount of copies of those books that they sell, like, in order to be able to put those out, and they, I think they need to and to staff the business the way that's they do. but but the thing is i since then i i start i after that i i hooked up with angelico press and i know they they do print print order mm-hmm. which cuts down on a lot of them. oh yeah and usually. they and and they pay they pay copy editors they pay uh, designers but they don't they <clears throat> angelico probably doesn't think of their primary customers as libraries and institutions well, and that's the problem you yeah. know in academic publishing you know, i always tell my students yeah. they're all trying to they're milking you when they're t- selling textbooks to kids yeah they shouldn't for be doing 150 that. Like, yeah, no those their customer <clears throat> is the the university or the yeah. library I it, mean, but but libraries aren't really buying books anymore. see and that's a problem yeah that's so, and that's why the whole model's really collapsing it, in it is ways. i mean the Unfortunately, and I don't—I didn't mean to go here in this conversation, <laughs> but like the whole student loan debt crisis situation connected. is such a scam that I, I look is. at it and I'm like, mm-hmm. how could I possibly, in good conscience, counsel my children to go to college exactly. in this in this state? System. Yeah. yeah, it's outrageous. Exactly. So there's that, and then that was in 2014, I think. In 2015, I published. No, and I have published another book that actually the same month, a uh, book of poetry, mm. Meditations in Times of Wonder. And then the next year, 2015, I published uh, The Submerged Reality, which is a book on sociology. After that, I did a, a case book on sociology called The Heavenly Country, mm. which has uh, one section full of primary sources. Yeah. So Burma... Robert Flood, Jane Led, John Portage, other people, Sloviev. That's a big section. And then there's another section of uh, sophiological poetry, which is, uh, you know, from history. There's Hildegard of Bingen's in oh, there, yeah. uh, Dante, as well as uh, Charles Williams. Got, you know, some more unknown poets like... Uh, well, Chesla Milos is in there, but also his 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 cousin was, uh, uh, Oscar de, de Milos, who wrote French. He's a beautiful poet. Not a lot of people know him. Um, and then the, the last third of that book are academic essays on different aspects of sociology. Mm-hmm. And then after that, I did the book on uh, on poetry, poetry, on poetics, uh, incarnation of the poetic word. And what did I follow that up with? <laughs> and then I followed that. The next one after that was uh, Transfiguration, mm-hmm. which is a, a kind of cultural criticism. And it touches on science. In fact, you know, science, art, pol- not politics, economics. I'm missing something. Education. Mm. Yeah, and and our, our current uh, involvement with... Uh, Electronic media and and dis- the, the distancing ourselves from the real through that, right? Yeah. Not just that, but that's uh, certainly a symptom of it. Oh, absolutely, contributor. Yeah. Uh, and now I've just started working on it. This week I'm writing a, a another book on sociology, and it's, which is it's, the working title is "The Exile of Sophia" or "Sophia in Exile," and that'll have parts on Gnosticism and Kabbalah. And I think I'll do a, I'm going to do a chapter on Thomas Traherne and William Blake, as well as, you know who Eleanor Fargin is? I don't. She wrote lyrics for, for one super famous song. She wrote the lyrics for Morning is Broken by Tom, uh, Cat Stevens' song. Oh, okay. Yeah. But it was actually a hymn. 
in an Anglican hymn book. Huh. And I, so I always loved that song, but then I, there was another, uh, Carol we used to sing when I was a Waldorf teacher and my family still sings it. Uh, People Look East, which mm-hmm. is a pretty famous. One. She wrote those lyrics too. Mm-hmm. And they all have this kind of Christian neo-pagan vibe to them. You know, they're all very connected to nature. So I wanted to investigate her more. I've been trying to track down her books. And um, there's one of her books, I think it's from 1903, maybe 1908, called Pan Worship, mm-hmm. which is phenomenal poetry. So I want to write a chapter on her as well. Interesting. Yeah, that would be good. Get to the bottom of that. Because I, I have not heard of her Yeah, that's before. why I think more people need to know about her. <laughs> yeah. That sounds like an interesting book. Yeah. Yeah. So... But I'm taking my time with this one. Usually I write pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I tell myself, I'll give myself a, a year to do this one. Usually I do it in about two months. But I'm going to stretch this one out. I want to enjoy this one. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the writing processes can be. <laughs> but once I get into the groove, you know what I mean? You don't yeah. want to get out of the groove. Right. But, uh, so we'll see. We'll see. I, I'm telling myself it'll be a year. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it might be done by April. <laughs> Well, just do it, it, do it, just handle it as it comes. Um, I'm curious how, I mean, I know historically in sort of the context, but how does Kabbalah fit into sociology other than this sort of, as like a reference points for like the Shekinah? Yeah. Um, well, that's what I'm trying to, trying to decide. Well, I think where it connects is with, uh, the Exile of the Shekinah, right? And there's a really interesting book that just came out uh, by Moshe Edel. It's called The Divine Feminine in Kabbalah mm-hmm. or something like that. Um, and he just kind of methodically goes through, you know, this kind of this idea of the, uh, of descent and reascent yeah. that goes through with, with, with the Shekinah, right? Where he connects to... Uh, Keter as well as Malkut. Yeah. Right. And, uh, that's right. But I think that, I think that's, that's Sophiology. That's Sophia right there is because there, in, uh, Sophiology, there's often people talk about, uh, the created and the uncreated Sophia. Yeah. I think in some schools, it's, um, Bina and Malkut. Yeah. And that's what, that's what interesting. He said he, he went back to the crown. Yeah. But he, so he changed, he didn't, he didn't change it. He's just going, he, he just does a methodical reading of all these mi- medieval and Renaissance mm-hmm. Kabbalists. And he says what they're doing, yeah, yeah. which is, which was it kind of shocked me because I, I, I assume the same thing you did. Um, but he knows Hebrew much better than I do. Yeah. There's another book. I don't know if you've encountered in your research, um, by a professor in Israel, Adam Afterman, I think his name is. I don't think so. Um, it's on the same sort of subject. Was it? Um, what's the name of the book? He, I saw him give a lecture. It was the rise of the Holy Spirit in 13th and 16th century Kabbalah. But huh. he, he was in the process of writing this book, which was all about ascent and descent and, okay. in Kabbalah and how that those dynamics like are central to the entire uh-huh. it's interesting. system. Actually, another thing, I can't remember, I have a stack of articles on my desk. Um, there's also a lot of thought out there that the rise of uh, understanding that Shekinah as, as a feminine pers- person, right? Divine person arose uh, in harmony or resonance with uh, the rise of the cult of Mary in the Middle Ages. Yeah, that's you know? an interesting point. Too. Yeah, because, you know, like, what's his name? Uh, Gershom Sholem doesn't see that when the Shekinah is mentioned in the Old Testament, or in Old Testament times, not it's not mentioned in the Old Testament, that it never seems to be about a person. Right. It's always about the presence of God. Yes, right? the divine presence. Yeah. But if that divine presence 
either becomes personified or people figure out that it's a per- that it's a person uh, in the Middle Ages. So here's yeah, a- doesn't it, and that also is coincidental, maybe with the cult of the Black Virgin. I think so. Yeah, absolutely. at least. Well, that's the cult. That of the cult of Mary comes around then, yeah. and then you know the praying of the Rosary, for instance, that mm-hmm. shows up around the 12th century. Interesting. Yeah, it's fascinating. And, I, and, that, and that's what I think in, in uh, what I've noticed in going through this. So going through this journey from Proverbs to today, looking at sociology as it develops over time. It seems, it seems to me that Sophia is this, this being of absolute humility. Mm-hmm. You know, behold the handmaid of the Lord, right? And, uh, and Burma was the first one, I think, to connect Sophia explicitly with the Virgin Mary, mm-hmm. right? And for him, the virginity is not uh, a case of an intact hymen, right. but it's a spiritual state, right? Yeah. A it's, a, it's, it's a return to the garden, right? Yeah, a purity, a humility, a yeah, really like authentic, yeah, yeah. And the, and that's you know a beautiful passage. If you ever get a chance to read Jane Led. In her uh, book, A Fountain of Gardens, where she talks about her first vision of Sophia. It's kind of beautiful, you know. Who, you know, and who, who, who is a, and, uh, um, Led was an Anglican, you know, and she, and, but she was connected to John Portage, who had been writing about Sophiology and been inspired by Burma. And she was thinking, wow, I, I just really want to feel connected to this. And then Sophia appears to her. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. And it happened, I think, it happened also with Solofiev, right? He had a, a vision of Sophia. And I, I suspect it happened with Bulgakov, but he, but he wouldn't out himself because he didn't want to get kicked out of the Orthodox Church. <laughs> they were, but yeah, he, they were already, he was already in trouble. But if you read his, his theology, it's, it's, uh, it's luminous in that way. Mm-hmm. You know, it's radical. It really is radical. Interesting. And this being identified herself as Sophia to them, or they just knew um, how to be that? I don't think Sloviev ever says he, he saw his color, his divine friend. Um, and But I can't remember, does she, does she say it to Led or not? I don't remember. Well, Led knew who it was. Well, I think if you also look at... Uh, Maybe the spiritual world doesn't like names as much as we do. Because when the Virgin Mary appears to kids, she never tells them her name. Um, they call her the sometimes lady. Sometimes she does, though. So. I mean, maybe not everyone, but I, I know at least one instance okay. where she did. Okay. There, it, it was like a series of visions, though. Well, I think with uh, Fatima in particular, I'm thinking about it. And also with... Uh, um, Bernard, St. Bernadette. Mm-hmm. She never never gave her name. They asked because they say, go ask her what her name is. What's your name? I'm the American Conception. Or she'd say something else. Uh, interesting. I'm the Lady of All Nations, which is the one from uh, Holland from the World War II. Yeah, I mean, the, this sort of uh, appearance is not as uncommon as it may seem like it should be. Yeah. I think that. Well, I, this has been a really wonderful uh, conversation. Yeah. I appreciate you taking the time to do this. I appreciate it too. Thank you. Yeah, it's been fun. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> um, I'm looking forward to your next book. Um, hearing a little bit about it is intriguing. In the Chamber of Reflection, we have a special interview with author Alan Blackwell about his wonderful book of short stories entitled 26 Gates. Listen to that exclusive recording at chamberofreflection.com or at our Patreon at patreon.com slash occult of personality. And I'd like to remind you that although you're able to listen to this podcast at no charge, it costs time and money to create. We ask you to support our efforts and the creation of future podcasts by joining the membership section at chamberofreflection.com 
or subscribing via Patreon at patreon.com slash occult of personality. And if you're already supporting the show or have done so in the past, my heartfelt thanks and I salute you. Thanks for listening, and until next time, 